Christ that way. He said you didn't learn Christ that way. You see, there's all the difference in the world about, about Christ and Christ. You see, if you're learning Christ, then you're learning to follow Him. You're learning to be like Him and to, to look like Him and talk like Him and to walk closer and closer as He would have us to walk. If you learn about Him, then you know. You know, you know He was born in a manger. You know that He died on the cross. You know that He healed many, that He fed thousands. You know those facts, but the facts don't change you. Now, I'm not saying don't know the facts, okay? I don't want to show that at all. Know the facts, but know the life. Know Christ and Him crucified. That's what we preach. And that's what's to be followed. We learn Christ. So not about Him. Learn Christ. That's the important thing. Well, the manner of life. In a very general sense, how are we to walk as Christians? Generally, I think verse 24 really points it out to us. He says, put on the new self, which is in the likeness of God, has been created in righteousness and holiness. I think it's interesting. Paul goes all the way back and he kind of has a picture now of creation. Remember, man was created in what? The image of God. Now you are created in the image of God. Well, in a general sense, what does that mean? In the general sense, it means you are created in righteousness and holiness. Things that we don't often think about. You know, we are a holy people. We are a sanctified people, Peter would say. We are a set-apart people. We are saints. Made in the image of God. When that old man is put off and the new man is put on, Christ and God remake us into His image. Holy. Look at 1 John chapter 1 again and chapter 2. What, what a great blessing we find there as we are made in His image. And then, generally, I think there's this other passage that we find down a little further that simply says, don't grieve the Spirit. Have you ever thought about it? Have you ever thought about the possibility in your life that you're grieving the Holy Spirit? Causing the Spirit to hurt. And that's what grief is. I mean, grief is not just a little sadness where you know, these little fake tears come to your eyes. Grieving is that's hurtful. Have you ever thought about it that we can so live that the Spirit grieves? You see, that Spirit has sealed us. I'm sure you studied that in, as you listened about Ephesians chapter 1, how the Spirit seals us. So live in a general sense that you don't hurt the Spirit of God. That you don't cause Him to grieve over how we act. Now specifically, what does it mean? Well, in regard to our speech, there are some things. First of all, it says, speak the truth. It says, therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak the truth, each one to his neighbor, for we are members one of another. You see, that's the important thing. We don't just speak the truth because that's a good thing to do. Hear no evil, speak no evil, you know. It, it, that's not why we do it. It's a good thing, but that's not why. Why do you speak the truth in the fellowship here? Why do you speak the truth to one another? Why do you say, when you say, I will do that, you do it. And when you say, I will help you with this hurt, you do it. You do that because we're members of one another. The picture goes back to remind you, doesn't it, of 1 Corinthians 12? The picture that the church is the what? The body of Christ. And so we are members of one another. What if your body lies to, part of your body lies to the rest of it? What if your hand all of a sudden said, ha ha, you know, I'm not going to tell the truth anymore. And so when you put your hand on that hot stove, it said, oh, I'm not hurting. What's going to happen? Your hand's going to burn. And then you're going to find an infection and that infection will spread to the rest of you. What happens when parts of the body lies to other parts of the body? Then it causes infection. It causes hurt. Why do we speak the truth? Because we're members one of another. That we have this relationship. That we have this love for each other, just as in our body. It says, let no corrupting talk proceed out of your mouth. Corrupting talk there, the word corruption means rottenness. It's used of fruit that's rotten, or of fish that's rotten. Have you ever had stinky fish? Sometimes people can talk like that. And when we think of corrupting talk, you know, the first thing that comes into our mind is cursing, right? Don't curse. Well, that's part of it. But 
but more than cursing. There are those other kinds of words that we can say that are corrupting as well. There are those other kind of words that aren't useful to the building up. You see, there's the contrast. Speak things that build people up. Well, what's the opposite? Those things that tear people down. Have you ever been around somebody that just tore everybody else up? I mean, they always were critical, always looking for what's wrong. When, whenever 99% of the things are done right, they'll say, well, did you see that 1%? Except they don't say it's the 1%. They want to make it bigger. You see, they're always looking for the wrong, always looking for the negative, always want to stress it. Aren't those people a lot of fun to be around? No, they're not. No, they're not. Don't be one. Don't let that corrupting talk, whether it be coarse talk, uh, or whether it be the talk that's harmful to the body. Don't let that come out of your mouth. So watch your speech. This is the positive that we're doing. You see, by the way, that means we do talk to each other. Church is not, can I come in last minute and leave first minute? That's not church. That's not fellowship. You see, when we come together, we have fellowship. We come together, we know each other, we love each other, we talk to each other, we build each other up in the most holy faith. That's the concept of what we're trying to do. And so we don't let that unworthiness, that unwholesomeness come from our mouth as the scripture will tell us there in verse 29. So instead it says, give grace. Let, let your speech be graceful. Now isn't that a, a different kind of contrast between the corrupt and the, and the grace? You've got the rotten fruit on one side, and you've got the, the beautiful tree on the other. How do you speak? How do you talk to others? And again, this is, this is part of the attitude that we're putting on. It's a way of life that we're adapting. Are we always going to do it perfectly? No, because we're people. But that's what we're going to work on. That's the way we're going to strive to be and how we're going to live. Well, in regard to actions, how are we to be? First of all, we're going to be honest in what we do. If Christianity doesn't make you an honest person, it doesn't make you anything. If it doesn't make you honest in your work ethic, it doesn't make you anything. If it doesn't make you honest when you have the opportunity to be dishonest, it doesn't make you anything. Christianity makes us an honest people. I mean, that's, that's just part of the basic foundation of who we are. Now, I think it's inter interesting. It says that you do honest work. It says stop. By the way, it says stop stealing. And, and as I understand it, that means evidently they've been doing it in the past and may still be doing it. And he's saying put it to an end now. Stop. Stop stealing. Why? So that you can have, do something honest. And with your honest labor, you have something to share with anybody who's in need. Share. Little boys were saying what they were going to be when they grew up. One said, I'm going to be a policeman. Another said, ah, I'm going to be a fireman. Another one said, I'm going to be a doctor. Another one said, I'm going to be a philanthropist. They said, what? He said, a philanthropist. And he said, well, why is that? And he said, well, because he's got the money. Well, he had half the idea of a philanthropist, right? He's got the money, but what does he do with it? He gives. He shares. And that's what we do. You see, the whole idea of the Christian lifestyle is not that we accumulate for ourselves. We accumulate to do what? So that we can be that which is just a fountain to give to others. And so it comes through us to bless others. That's the concept. So that's part of our lifestyle. How are you sharing what you have with other people? It's a good thing to share through the church and you do a great job in benevolence. That's a great thing. And do that. Because as you give, you're helping in, in those ways. Benevolence and missions and others. But how are you also sharing with anyone who has need? Are you trying to, to have an eye that looks to the person who's needy as well. That's part of our lifestyle. And then in regard to emotion, what are we to be? Scripture says, be angry. Now that's not saying, okay, you be angry, you be angry. You... No, it's not saying that at all. But rather it could be, if you're angry, don't sin. Now in the Old Testament we find that the anger of God is mentioned a number of times. So you can be angry and not sin. But when you're angry, you're in danger. All right, we're not God. And when we're angry, we're in danger of doing those things and saying those things that, that are sinful and are wrong. And so we have to watch. Anger is just one, short, uh, one letter short of danger. And I think that's an important thing for us to remember. 
Be angry, but don't sin. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. It's saying basically that, that you take care of it. Take care of it while it's fresh. Don't let it simmer. Don't let it fester. Little boys were fighting, and the mother came to one little boy, and he said, she said, now, now, I know you're really mad at your brother, but the Bible says don't let the sun go down on your anger. And so you need to go and make it right. And the little boy said, well, can we figure out some way to keep the sun up a little longer? Yeah, that's how we are, aren't we? That's how we need to work on. That's how we need not to be. We need to, to really work on that. Watch our anger. And then it says don't give opportunity to the devil. Anger, again, gives that opportunity for us to, to lash out, for us to do something that we'll regret. The scripture or the song we often sing is angry words, let them never. From the tongue and bridle slip. Brightest links of life are broken. It will continue to say by a single angry word. Watch what we do. Don't give an opportunity for the devil. And then it says, let bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, all malice to be put away. And so here's just kind of a, a broad list. And, and in the first century, they often gave lists of virtues and lists of the uh, opposite of virtues that were to be put away. And so Paul does that here. And you see these things, really they all come from the root of bitterness. I mean, when one is bitter, when one is sour, when, when one has that in their life, then they clamor, they fuss about things, they will fuss about people, they will have anger toward people, they'll do all of these other things as well. comes from that bitterness, it's just in the root of them. And so, put that away. You know, we're not, we're not going to have that in part of our, as part of our emotion, part of our life. We're, we're going to get rid of that bitterness. Um, I remember one woman in, in one congregation that I worked with long, long, long time ago before I ever, while I was still away from this area, away from, from anywhere uh, around close or where I've been lately. But I remember this woman, okay, and this woman sat right, like, right there, not, not you, but like there. <laughs> and she had the, she looked like she sucked on a limb. In fact, there were two of them, they sat together. And it's a good thing they sat together because they didn't sit with anybody else. They just sat together, and, and they always were sour, always had their arms folded just like this. I remember walking by after preaching, they go, Phew. probably for good reason back then, I'm sure. But, but they'd go like that. When services were over, everybody went out the back doors. They went out the side doors. They were just, just bitter. And it was sad. It was sad to, to see that happen in their life. And so bitterness can work on us, work on that root. Let bitterness not be a part of us, nor a part of our life. Be, rather it says, kind one to another. That kindness is a different kind of attitude. Kindness is, is so opposite of what the world says. The world says, be tough. Look out for number what? One. Look out for number one. Kindness says you're not looking for number one, you're looking for another. You're looking for how you can help and how you can be a part. It says to be tender-hearted. Tender-hearted? Tender-hearted won't work in the 21st century. Tender-hearted won't work in the business world. It won't work in your family life. It won't work at school. It won't work on the athletic field. It won't work anywhere. Well, it will. In the real sense, in the real sense of how we're to live and how we're to be, it works. And that's how we are to be. Tender-hearted one toward another. The tender-hearted helps us to have that kindness. You see, they just kind of work together there for us. It says forgiving one another. Forgiving. As I understand that, here it says give grace to each other. Grace is when you don't deserve it. And that's what forgiveness is. Sometimes I don't deserve to be forgiven, but somebody will give me that grace to forgive me. And that's the concept. Give grace. Do they deserve it? No, they don't deserve it. But you give it anyway. You give that grace. It's not like Bill and Joe. Joe was dying. He knew that he was dying. He'd had a big running feud with Bill. He hadn't had been his best friend, hadn't seen him in years. Called Bill to come and said, you know, I'm dying. I want to make things right. And so uh, Bill came and, and, and so he said, well, you know, I've, I know I'm dying. I want to make things right with you. And he said, you know, that's okay, we'll make things right. So they shook hands and, and, and he said, well, I forgive you and I forgive you. And then as Bill was walking out, Jim said, well, you, you do know that if I get well, all this is off. You see, that's how some people are. I think about it if I'm dying. I think about it if I'm going to meet the Lord.
But otherwise, we're just going to write over everybody off. That's not it at all. Forgiving one another. Why do you forgive? As Christ, or as God in Christ has forgiven you. There's the key. You see, we give, we forgive when we see how much we've been forgiven. Who of us can stand before the Lord and say, oh, we deserve, we deserve to, to be able to stand here. We deserve to be able to, to be forgiven because we're so good. Not one of us. We can't do it. And so we have that concept. We forgive. And so we have then that new mind that leads us to have a, a new heart in there that leads us to new action and new behavior and a lifestyle that's that. And so it's said that we put these things on. Now, it takes effort. It takes effort to get out of the bed in the morning, doesn't it? You have to throw one leg out of the bed and then you have to get up, stand up, put on clothes. It takes effort to put something on. It takes effort to be kind. It takes effort to forgive. It takes effort not to be angry. It takes effort, but that's what it's to do. And we do that as we walk in that lifestyle of Christ and as we follow in Him to be His. Well, why do you do it? Why do you do it? When we look in the text, we do it because there is for us eternity. And eternity hangs in the balance of whether or not we put off these things or put on these things. As we close, I just want to share with you an illustration. I wish I had made it up, but I didn't, which doesn't surprise me. But uh, it's an illustration that's really helped me to kind of have an idea of what eternity is. Some, you know, somebody used to tell me eternity is it's, uh, when... You take all the oceans and you take a little bird and he takes a drip of water and he flies the moon and by the time he transports all that water, yeah, I never got it, okay? I mean, I, you did, but you didn't. But this helped me and maybe, maybe it'll help you too. You see, this part of our rope represents your life, okay? This is life. You're born, you know, everybody's happy and they're patting, you know, dad and mom, you know, everything's good. You go to school and school's tough. You know, you school, you have opportunities to to cheat, you know, is, that test is really important. That test will determine, you know, how I do on that test might determine college. Or, or that game, you know, that game is really important. How am I going to act in that? So, so we get past that, and then we get married, and here we have a job, and, and in this job we have all these opportunities, you know, to, to go up the ladder, but if we go do this, I, you know, I know that it's, it's not right, I know it's a little dark, I know it's a little going the wrong way, but, but if I do that, then, then I'm going to go up that ladder and that's going to be really important because I'm going to make more money because, you know, so this is, this is retirement. This is what we're looking for. You know, we, we're going to retire. We're going to travel, you know, do all these things. So I'm, I, I, you know, I'm going to make more money and I know it's not the right way, but, but it's going to help me to get there. So we, we have our kids and, and we help them and we get through work and we get through retirement. And then after retirement, what happens? Then we die. Okay, so this is your life. And this is your life where, you know, that, that anger comes and the bitterness ferments. It's there, it's there. Okay, it's really important because it's like Jim and Bill. I mean, this is really important and so it's breaking our relationship. It's there. Or, or this sensuality, you know, this, this sexual temptation that's really strong. I mean, it's really, really strong. So it's right here in my life. And I know it might wreck my family, and I know it might, might hurt, but it, you know, it's there. And it's really strong. And so, you see that now. I want you to see all of that, even the strong temptations you go through, I want you to see all of that in the, in the sense that this is your life. And let me guarantee you, when you're the age of the teenagers, they're saying, oh, life is long, 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 long. And when you're the age of me, it's say, oh, no, well, we're looking more at this end. It's not so long. And we began to understand the scripture that says life's but a vapor that appears for a little while and vanishes away. And so we see our life and, and all those temptations and all those things that we've had that have been so strong and have influenced our life and how we live. And that's our life. And then comes death. And then after death, what? There's Christ. And after death, judgment. And after death, there's eternity. So let's say we live for 110 years, okay? So after you've been in eternity, and I know time's not counted, but after you've been in eternity for 110 years, okay, how important, how important was that 
sexual temptation now. How important was cheating on that test so I could make college? Well, let's say, okay, you've lived that long, well, you know, eternity is, continues to go, and let's say even to here, now how important is it? How important is it? And eternity goes on and on, and we sing a song, when we've been there, help me, 10,000 years, bright, shining as the sun, I have no less time to spend God's praise, sing God's praise than when I've first begun. Oh, but, but this is life. And this is the important time, right? I mean, God, remember how, how important it is that I really show that person how bad they've been to me. Or, it really was a really big temptation. But what about it now? When you've been there... 10,000 years, when you continue to be there, and it goes on and on, and the illustration ends because somewhere down there my rope's going to end, but do you see it? You see, life, life just a bit, but, we, but it seems so strong right now, but it's gone in a second, and we say, well, yeah, but I'm just on this end, and I've got a lot of living to do, and I, you know, I've got a lot of time to make things right, we don't know that. We don't know that from shootings that have happened. Unfortunately, we don't know that from storms that have happened. We don't know that. We're not guaranteed it. What are you guaranteed? You are guaranteed if you put off that old man and you put on the new man and you make those changes and you live that life, you may have some trouble and you may have some trial here, but throughout eternity... As you're singing God's praise, as you're around His throne, as you're serving Him as we shall throughout all of eternity, you will rejoice because you're saved. Not because of your good works, but because of His. By His grace, by His mercy, He allowed you to put on that new man and to walk in the new life. What are we doing here? It's about making this right for this. And if you're not, then you need to make a change. If you're not a Christian, if you haven't put on Christ, then you've got that opportunity tonight to become a child of His through believing Him, changing your life in repentance, confessing Him before men, being immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins. Don't just think of those things as things we run through. Those are life changes, but so important as you put Him on. Maybe you've done those things and you've turned from the light and you've turned from the things that you put on to putting on the wrong things and gone back to the world. You need to make a change. You can do that. Maybe it's just between you and God. Then from your seat, make it right with God. Maybe it's something you need to ask for the brothers and sisters here to help you with. Do that. You've got that.